Hey guys, Dr. Mike Israel here for today's topic of rep ranges and muscle growth. Ooh, sounds pretty cool. All right, so before we talk about what repetition ranges, how many reps to do per set to grow the most muscle, we gotta go all the way back to the fundamental underlying causes of hypertrophy via training. What is it about training that causes muscle growth? It's a very important question to ask. So a lot of individuals start talking about what rep ranges are best for muscle growth, and they start at second or third order principles, some things that might relate but maybe don't. We gotta go all the way back to the fundamental basics because that's where all the answers start out. So for hypertrophy training, the fundamental thing we have to realize is that we're stimulating growth at the molecular level. We have to make sure that however we train is actually supported or scientifically shown to stimulate growth. Not just how something feels, not just what we think it's doing, is it causing growth? Luckily, we know with a very high likelihood that there are three rather independent growth factors or training mediated growth factors. Things you can do, the way your training affects your physiology, your actual muscles and your actual cells that cause growth. Here are the three of them in order of probably how important they are to growth on average. Right? First of all, the most fundamental is a high workload. That means your muscles contracting through, presenting force through a distance of contraction, creating literal physical work at a high intensity. If you accomplish a lot of work at a high intensity, your muscles have literal force detectors inside of them that Every time you're generating a lot of force, and for some unit time, and through a range of motion, then your muscles are literally receiving a stimulus to grow. So doing lots of heavy work is a stimulus for hypertrophy, and your muscles detecting that heavy work, right? nothing fancy, no burn, no pump, is the way most growth happens, right? or a very large amount of it anyway. Another probably independent way to cause growth is what we call metabolite accumulation. There are metabolites, uh, for example, lactate and its attendant ions, that when they are presented to the cell, so when, when muscle cells are working very hard, they're generating a lot of byproducts, a lot of these metabolites, and sometimes they can't clear them as fast into the bloodstream. And you have a higher and higher and higher metabolite load, what we call the burn, right, and it results in a pump. That a high degree of metabolites probably independently causes some hypertrophic adaptations. It causes gains to occur, right? We're not sure exactly how that mechanism works, but there's a very high likelihood that something, either the metabolites themselves or something that comes along with generating a lot of metabolites, basically going for a burn that usually occurs close to failure, that burn itself, even if the weight is pretty light, probably causes a considerable amount of hypertrophy. Probably not as much as the workload mediated hypertrophy of just training hard and heavy and a lot, but to some extent. And lastly, the third independent cause for hypertrophy is a stretch of a muscle under load. So instead of doing your dumbbell flies and stopping short, if you stretch them deep and literally pull the muscle apart under load, regular stretching doesn't make you bigger, but loaded stretching, particularly going through a full range of motion with all of your uh, training movements, causes hypertrophy in and of itself. Now, training, uh, stretching under load is something you should probably be doing all the time with full range of motion anyway, so it's not gonna play in a whole lot into our differentiation of rep ranges. Whatever reps you're doing, all of them should be full range of motion with a big stretch. That being said, the reps do affect, uh, are affected differently by intensity ranges, workloads, and metabolites. So let's take a look. It turns out that you have essentially two different ends of muscle fiber spectrums in your body, right? The, the old idea that there were slow twitch muscles on one end and fast twitch muscles on the other isn't exactly true, but there are lots of intermediate types of muscles between them. Some muscles behave more fast twitch, and we'll talk about what that means in just a second. Some behave more slow twitch, right? Fast twitch muscles tend to be larger to begin with. They hypertrophy quicker. They have more contractile elements and less endurance elements like mitochondria. They're very good for short distances of exertion, short durations of exertions, but super high forces. They produce a lot of speed and power with each contraction, but their endurance really, really stinks. 
On the other hand, fibers that are more on the slow twitch end tend to be smaller to begin with. They hypertrophy from training, but not a ton, not as much as the fast twitch. They have less contractile elements or actual proteins to generate force and more mitochondria inside them. They're better vascularized. They're better at endurance, but they're not so amazing at getting much power or much strength out of them as much as the faster twitch fibers. So basically, from this we can derive that there are three points on a spectrum, and these fiber types that occur at these three points on the spectrum probably respond a bit differently to what their optimum hypertrophy stimulus is. Now, be very, very clear, they all grow from all of the uh, hypertrophy stimuli we talked about earlier. They all grow from high workloads, they all grow from volumes, and they all grow from, from stretch for sure, and they certainly all grow from metabolites, but some grow much more from some of these than others. So we have three essentially different types of muscle fiber type or kinds. We have super fast twitch muscle fibers, really low on endurance, but super big and powerful. We have an intermediate area, intermediate endurance types, some characteristics of fast, some of slow, not super big, but not super small. And lastly, we have much slower fiber types. And potentially we'd want to grow all of them, and they probably respond to different parameters, different factors of hypertrophy training a little bit differently. Here's what I mean. Seems like faster twitch muscles, the very biggest, fastest twitch, the most explosive, get their best growth stimulus, are literally molecularly prepared to accept growth more from moderate workloads, right? Not a ton of sets, but very high intensities, 75% or more of a one repetition maximum. We'll talk about what that means in reps in a second, but just remember that. Fast twitch muscles probably are best stimulated by hard training, not a ton of volume, but heavy, heavy reps. On the other hand, intermediate muscle fiber types probably best stimulated for their growth by very high workloads, lots and lots of sets, lots of total work done, but at moderate intensities of 60% 1RM or more, which could mean uh, something for a rep range, we'll talk about what that means in a second, but definitely they can benefit from lighter weights done for very high numbers of reps or higher numbers of reps and very large numbers of sets. So that's for the intermediate fibers. For the slowest twitch of the fibers, metabolite accumulation probably what grows them the most. Slow twitch fibers don't tend to grow much from high forces. They do, but not nearly as much as the fastest twitch fibers. They grow pretty well from high volumes, but they probably go the best from metabolite sequestration and summation from the burn. So where do we go from here? That's some pretty good insight. Before we expand on what rep ranges that translates into and what fiber types we want to grow, we have to recognize something very important, that we might not want to grow all of those fibers at the same time. We might not want to grow all of those fibers to their maximum size. Now, hold on a second. Don't we just want to get jacked? Isn't it a good idea to grow all of them to get as big as possible? Yes. So bodybuilders, people interested in enhancing their physiques, CrossFit athletes that have to do a variety of different kinds of exertions are probably interested in hypertrophying all the fibers as much as possible. But not everyone should, and here's why. Per unit of cross-sectional area, how thick the muscle fiber is, and thus how much it weighs and how much space it takes up in your body, fast twitch muscle fibers, or faster twitch, produce not only more force per that area, right? per certain muscle size, they're literally stronger, but even more importantly, they produce much more power and much more speed. So if you're looking to gain muscle size to translate that into a really high force, one repetition max ability, into power ability for weightlifting, let's say, or gymnastics, or into speed ability for sprinting or jumping, you're probably not interested in growing a whole lot of intermediate fibers, definitely not interested in hypertrophy or slow twitch fibers. So when you're doing hypertrophy training to only get fast twitch fiber hypertrophy, you should stick to the kind of hypertrophy training that really hypertrophies the fast twitch fibers well, but kind of leaves everything alone to some extent. Does that make sense? So we want to make sure that we first realize that sometimes, particularly in powerlifting, weightlifting, and some elements of gymnastics and track and field, we might only be interested in super fast twitch fiber development, which means we have to stick to that range of the growth range, which we'll talk about what that is in just a second. You probably have already a good hint at what it is. But remember, don't just take for granted that we need to just grow everything possible, because especially for weightlifting and powerlifting, definitely in sprinting too, because you can't just get that big, you power to weight ratio goes off. There are weight classes, right? If you have a person who weighs 200 pounds and competes at a weight class close to that, that has the same amount of muscle as another person that weighs 200 pounds, 
but person number one has more fast twitch fibers and less slow twitch fibers filling in that space, taking up that weight, what ends up happening is that person who has more fast twitch fibers is going to be just as jacked looking, and you're going to look at the meat and, ooh, who's going to win? Well, they're both just as jacked. The person who has more fast twitch fibers is going to be more strong, more explosive, and have higher rates of speed. So if that person is competing in that endeavor, it's probably a good idea for them to limit the hypertrophy to those kinds of fibers, right? If you're, let's say, some freak accident, you're almost all slow twitch fibers, but you're super jacked at 200 pounds, your endurance at super high reps, your ability to do drop sets, etc., your ability to run an 800 meter will be phenomenal. But that's very different than being able to run 10 meters really fast, to be able to jump really fast, or to lift one rep maxes in powerlifting, and especially with, with speed production in weightlifting. So before you go ahead and try to grow everything, realize that you might, in some situations, particularly weight class sports that really, really heavily favor strength and power and speed, you might just want to grow your fastest twitch fibers and leave everything else a little bit alone. But for a lot of other sports, and especially for all of physique, we want to grow all the fibers. So how do we do that? Well, here we go. You want to make sure that you take care of every fiber, and every fiber gets growth. So you have to make sure that every part of your training, through all broad spectrum of rep ranges, attends to those fibers. So the fastest twitch fibers, remember we said two things. Plenty of work, not a ton, but really heavy. Higher than 75% of 1RM is where those fibers are for sure taxed to their limit, for sure stimulated for growth. So sets of 6 to 10 repetitions on average, and just remember, not at failure, but close to failure, you know, 3, 4 reps away from failure, and then as you go through your mesocycle, you get closer and closer to failure. So hard sets between 6 and 10 repetitions generally almost guarantee that your fastest twitch fibers are going to get a stimulus. If you go heavier than that and say start doing you know 80, 80 or 85 percent plus 90 percent plus sets of two to five reps, yes, that will stimulate hypertrophy. But every time you do a set of two to five reps, it fatigues you so much you're not going to be able to do enough training to get the maximum stimulus. Because remember, intensity is important, but so is volume. So you want to have an intensity that's high enough to stimulate gains for the fastest your fibers, which is you know anything 10 reps or below, but not so fatiguing for each set that you can only do three or four sets, and then you're like, oh my god, there's no way I'm going to survive this. So six to 10 reps gives us that awesome trade-off, heavy enough to cause growth in the fastest switch fibers, but also light enough to allow us recovery enough so that we can do the most work that we need to and still get good benefits. So with the fastest twitch fibers, six to 10 rep sets are the meat and potatoes. For inter intermediate twitch fibers, 10 to 15 rep sets are probably where it's at. These sets are still heavy enough to stimulate 60% uh, plus adaptations, right? They're still heavy enough to do a good job of stimulating growth in the intermediate fibers. Not ideal for the fast twitch fibers, but they certainly help there as well. But in six to 15 rep range is where you get that best trade-off of heavy enough, but you can really put in the volume. How, how do you do that? Well, sets of 12, for example, that's 12 reps. Each rep adds volume. So a high rep set, even if it's a heavy set of six versus a lighter set of 12, a set of 12 is gonna have more volume to begin with. So it's a really great way to accumulate out of workload. And also, you can typically do more of those sets in a program and not get as fatigued. So while you may be able to have you know 15 working sets per muscle group per week, of six to 10 reps, and after that it's too much, you might be able to pull off 20 sets of 10 to 15 reps and recover just the same. It's even more volume, and because it's heavy enough, it's good enough, especially for those intermediate twitch fibers. Lastly, the slowest twitch fibers probably respond best to reps of 20 plus, 20 to 30 reps maybe, to supersets, to drop sets, and to all those other kinds of meta metabolite techniques to give you a crazy pump, crazy burn, and really stimulate that slow twitch fiber growth. So when we're training for size, in some sense, especially in the long term, and we'll get to what I mean by that in a second because you might not train all these things at the same time, if we want full muscular development, we've got to go through relatively low reps, 6 to 10, we've got to go through 10 to 15 rep range, and we should also sometimes go in the drop set, supersets, 20 reps plus range, so that every single kind of muscle fiber is being uh, stimulated to its maximum and nothing's really being left out. Because you can envision a situation in which you, let's say, only do super heavy training, right? Only six to 10 reps all the time. You're gonna get really big, you're gonna get really muscular, but your slower twitch and intermediate twitch fibers, your intermediate twitch fibers will be okay, your slow twitch fibers won't be very altered, and your intermediate twitch fibers could be altered even better. On the other hand, if you go on the other extreme and just do drop sets, supersets, etc., you're going to have slow twitch fibers that are hypertrophying pretty well, but you know, you're going to be missing out on the other, other fiber hypertrophy, and that's not good if you want full development. Right? Now, here's the deal. 
do we train all these at the same time? So like right now you might be thinking, okay, uh, I got a perfect program. I do some heavy work, sets of six to 10. Then after that, I do some lighter work, 10 to 15. And then I finish off the workout with burnouts, right? Maybe, maybe. But <clears throat> especially for more advanced athletes, the phasic approach of doing some of these things and not others and sequencing them is probably superior. And here's why. First of all, especially if you're an advanced athlete, your recovery abilities are going to start being more delimited than your training abilities. What does that mean? An advanced athlete has no problem training more psychologically and through energy production than they can recover from, right? All you gotta do is let them loose in the gym and they'll probably come back overtrained. Recovery is the biggest impetus or the biggest uh, uh, kind of backstop to growth, the, the biggest limiter of growth in more advanced athletes. If only they could recover more, they could train to their heart's content and grow that much more. But in every single case for especially advanced athletes, recovery abilities are usually more limited than training abilities. What does that mean? That means we can't train everything all at the same time as hard as we want because we have this much total recovery ability, but if we trained everything that we could, we would do this much training, right? There's a gap here that we can't fill. So we gotta take some of our training and do it at some times, wait, and then do other kinds of training at other times because we only have so much of a box to fill in with recovery. But that sounds kind of depressing because we can't advance our armies on all fronts at the same time. Good news though, muscle building, okay, is hard. But maintaining muscle is not. Once you have built muscle, and especially if you're an advanced athlete, it's been shown that advanced athletes retain muscle and other fitness characteristics better than beginners. It's actually pretty easy to conserve muscle after building it, even if you're not using the optimal methods. So what does that mean? To build your big, fastest twitch muscle fibers, you probably need sets of six to 10 reps to do the best job of it. But if you go to just regular, uh, uh, normal training, volume training, sets of 10 to 15 reps, that's enough of a stimulus not to build much of your fast twitch fibers anymore, not the fastest, but it's enough of a stimulus to maintain them. And even metabolite training, because at the end of a, a superset, your, all of your motor units are being recruited, even though if it's not at high forces, right? At the end of a superset, you still eat, re recruit and stimulate enough fast twitch fibers that maintenance probably isn't an issue. So the good news we have, the bad news is we can't train everything all at the same time. The good news is when we back away from something and replace it with something else, emphasis, de-emphasis, we keep everything or almost everything of what we gained before. So the phasic approach can really, really work super well. Here's an example of how it would work. You can probably work, remember we said if maybe two thirds of your ability to recover, right? So you don't have to just train one thing at a time. It's not just fast twitch at a time. You can probably combine two modalities. So for a couple of mesocycles, one or two, you can do a combination of heavy training and moderate training. That means you your main sets at six to 10 and some down sets at 10 to 15 reps, right? Vary the exercises or whatever. So you're growing your fast twitch muscles a ton, your intermediate twitch plenty, your slow twitch are kind of on the back burner. They're getting some stimulus, but mostly they're just being conserved from the last time you train them heavily. After that, for one to two mesocycles, you can do a combination of moderate intensity work and metabolite work. So test sets of 10 to 15 and drop sets, supersets, et cetera. That kind of situation will, so the first situation, the first couple of mesocycles, you grew your fast twitch muscles and your intermediate twitch. In this one, you're growing your intermediate twitch and your slow twitch the most while fast twitch is just hanging out. After that, you're gonna accumulate a lot of fatigue the very act of hypertrophy training is going to be desensitized for you. So you probably want to do something we've Renaissance mentioned numerous times, a maintenance phase where you train maybe only in three to six repetition sets, pretty heavy for very low volumes. You're not going to be growing much of anything. You're going to be conserving your fast twitch muscle fibers and probably all the others as well. You're going to let your fatigue fall down. You're going to let your uh, resistance to training decrease. And then you're going to go back around and repeat that process of going heavy training, moderate training, moderate training, metabolite training, and then back around. In that way, you get two benefits. One, you get to train everything. And two, you get a staleness reduction across the board. You're never training any modality all the time. So there'll be times when you come back to training fast twitch, really high force training, you go, oh my God, I haven't done this in one or two med cycles. It's gonna cause new gains altogether. And the metabolite stuff is gonna cause new gains altogether because there'll be times you're not using it for extended periods. So not only do we get the benefits of training everything and at maintaining, but we get freshness at every step, which is really, really good. The deal with that is we overload two systems at a time, okay? We let one of them resensitize while the other two are being trained. You might notice that we're 
taking fast twitch fibers, the very fastest, and training them almost all the time. The moderate fibers are getting trained, or the intermediates, almost all the time, but the metabolites only once every now and again. The reason is that metabolite training probably isn't as long-term of a strategy and isn't as powerful of a growth mediator, and slow twitch muscle fibers per unit size don't grow as quickly or to as large amounts as fast twitch fibers. So if you have a normal 50-50 fast to slow arrangement in your body, which we'll talk about in just a second what that means, if you have the average number of fast twitch intermediate and slow twitch fibers, your training shouldn't be all three biased uh, together in a, in, a, in, a, in a similar biasing pattern. It should always be a little bit biased towards the faster twitch because they grow the most. Right. So, you know, if you have a certain amount of, uh, you know, let's say you have a really advanced battle tank in your arsenal and you have like a Jeep, like an armored Jeep that's kind of broken and halfway works and it's not even very well armored. So it gets hit a lot and might blow up on you. You know, if you have a gas tank and armaments to put into those two vehicles, which are very limited, which one are you really going to put the most stock in into battle? Well, you know, your main battle tank, that, that's your main thing. And it's got the highest chance of doing the most damage to the enemy. You probably want to put more of your resources there because it's simply going to be more productive for you. You'll put some resources into the Jeep just in case, but just not, you're going to put all your weapons and fuel into the Jeep because it's not what's going to gift you your most gains in combat, right? It's the same way we know fast twitch muscles just plain old grow faster and bigger eventually. So even if we have an even number of fast, intermediate, and slow twitch fibers in our bodies, which most of us do, we're still going to create a pattern where we train mostly fast and intermediate and a little bit of slow twitch every now and again. Because if we spend the same amount of time on all of them, it turns out that we shouldn't be spending that much time on slow twitch fibers. Some more tips for more advanced individuals. Okay, so that, that general framework is going to work for everybody. However, here are some advanced tips. First of all, some individuals have more fast twitch fibers or more intermediate twitch or more slow twitch fibers than the average person. Right? We're going to find out how you can tell that in just a second, which one you are, or if you're in the middle or somewhere uh, on the extremes. But what you do there is you can bias the phase times and the rep ranges as well to make sure you're getting what you need. So let's say you're a more extreme fast twitch individual. You have 70% more fast twitch muscles and maybe 20% intermediate twitch and only 10% slow twitch. It'd be uh, really interesting. You'd probably be a very high caliber sprinter or something like that. But let's say you're pretty extreme on the fast twitch. We'll talk about how to figure that out in a second. If you're in that situation, the phases that train six to 10 reps should be longer for you. Your reps might should be closer to six to eight reps and not often eight to 10 reps. No, we're taking each rep range and buying and saying it heavier. When you go into your moderate reps, which you should do every now and again, you might want to stick to 10 to 12 reps instead of you know 15 or 16 reps. And of metabolite training, you might only be able to do um, every couple of months for two or three weeks at a time and not really put much emphasis into it because it's not going to work a whole lot. And I'll tell you why that, that can be and how you can tell that which one you are in a second. So if you're more slow twitch, you might want to do higher end of the rep range for all of those, have shorter uh, sort of low rep phases, longer moderate and longer metabolite phases with a lot more work emphasized on those. It's something you're going to have to figure out. And we'll tell you how in a second. But before we do, it's not just in individuals that this can occur, but specific muscles that individuals have. So your hamstrings might be more fast twitch and require a more fast twitch kind of arrangement, heavier work, longer phases, lower reps on average. Still moving through all the phases, just biased in the direction of heavier, but your quads might be more intermediate or slow twitch, which means they could require a little bit more of that higher volume, higher repetition, phasic planning, and maybe some higher reps as well, slightly lower weights. Individual muscles can also be variant like that, not just between individuals. So your chest might be super slow twitch, your triceps might be super fast twitch, your biceps might be somewhere in between, and so on and so forth. Here's the deal. How can you tell fiber type? These are all very educated, rough guesses. You just have to do your best job with them. And this isn't in a particular order of importance. One good way, decent way of beginning is to figure out what rep ranges get you the most pumped, the most sore per unit volume. Because remember, soreness is a symptom of disruption and damage. Disruption and damage probably underlies most of these hypertrophic uh, situations. So 
You don't want to do too much damage, but the the one training method that gets you the most damaged, you can now do less volume of it and probably get more gains, right? So, for example, some individuals say that when they do sets of some very fast twitch individuals will do sets of six to eight in the squat and get annihilated, super sore, super messed up, can't walk for days, enormous pump, wow. Individuals that tend to be more slow twitch can do a set of six to eight in the squat and literally just look around and be like, Okay, when's the next one? Did that hurt? I don't know, it's kind of heavy, it's kind of annoying. Do you have a pump? Nope, not remotely. I can do about a million and a half more of these. But for those individuals, if they do drop sets or uh, forced reps or supersets, it burns and pumps them like the world is coming to an end. Their muscles are ready to blow up. Where those super fast twitch individuals, a lot of them, especially really good bodybuilders, tend to be more fast twitch. Some of them, and this is reported in, in various muscle magazines have written about this and videos have been made, where really high-level bodybuilders that came from a fast twitch background, I'll tell you about that in just a second what that means, they'll say, you know, I tried all those drop sets and stuff like that. The only thing that happens is they get really tired. I get really out of breath. My muscles feel stringy and achy and, and, and I never really get a big pump. I just feel fatigued. That's not how you want to feel after hypertrophy training. You want to feel jacked up. So whatever method, if it's super low reps, if it's intermediate reps, if it's super high reps, that's the one in which your fiber types probably predominate in that muscle. So for example, if you train your back and if you do sets of six and you just don't feel a thing, it just feels heavy and it's like it's breaking you down, no pump, nothing, uh, eh, try some higher reps and see how it feels. But when you try those higher reps, sets of 15 or something like that, or drop sets, you might get this huge back pump and everything's awesome. That might mean if that reliably occurs in your training and something you've noticed over time, over months and years, that you're probably a little bit more intermediate and slow twitch in your back. On the other hand, you might try the same thing for your chest. And someone's like, hey man, let's do a cable fly drop set and then a, you know bench uh, you know like uh, just 135 pounds for a total of 100 reps. You do as many reps as you can, you rack the bar, you wait for 15 seconds and you repeat. You might do that in your pecs, you're just literally super tired. And you're like, ugh, and you have no pump. You're just kind of like, oh my God, I feel like I ran a mile. You know, if you run a mile, you're not gonna get a quad pump if you're in decent shape, you're just going to feel tired, right? And that's slow twitch fibers being active. So if your chest has a predominance of fast twitch fibers and you try to get it to do slow twitch kind of activities, drop sets, et cetera, it might just not feel a damn thing and just be kind of fatigued. You burn up all your glycogen and you're like, eh, I don't know. And the next day people are like, hey, are you sore? And you're like, nah, not really, right? But if you do sets of eight in the dumbbell fly and sets of six in the wide grip bench, you're sore for three or four days. You're like, oh my God, I got to reduce my volume. This is too much. That's a good sign. That might mean you're more fast twitch. And of course, there's everything in between those. So that's a good first starting sign. Another one that's not super reliable but can add to your knowledge base is if you're better at, rep, uh, at higher reps or at singles, right? So for example, you have a certain one repetition max, as a bunch of other people in your gym, something very similar. Let's say you can squat 225 for a single. If you can squat 185 for like a set of 10, you're probably very slow twitch. That means you're not very well designed for maximum lifting, but your endurance at even slight submaximal abilities, because you have so many slow twitch and maybe intermediate twitch fibers, is a really, really high level. If you can do 185 for 10 and only max 225, you're probably not working with a whole lot of fast twitch fiber. Now, there's technique differences, there's nervous system differences, there's leverage differences that can present all those differences, but it's just another thing to add in that if that happens as well as the pump and the burn, now you're starting to see some patterns there. On the other hand, if you can squat 225 for a max, but you, 185 is a hard double for you, instead of a set of 10, you're probably really, really fast twitch. Another interesting thing you can play around with is what your failure looks like. Now, of course, get a spotter, don't do this on squats, maybe on bench presses, maybe on leg press. People who are very fast twitch tend to fail because fast twitch muscles, when they get fatigued because their motor units, their parts of the muscles are so big, when a motor unit fails on you, it's a huge reduction in force. Fast twitch muscles fatigue rapidly. Slow twitch muscles can keep going even when they're tired. So in the bench press, for example, if you do a set of eight and it goes one, two, three, and then at seven or at eight, let's say it's your max, you go, oh, Ooh, and it just falls right back down on you. We all had training partners like that. It's more likely that they're very fast twitch. If you have a very slow twitch training partner, and I, I used to train um, a variety of individuals in a strength and conditioning setting, some of the 5,000, 10,000 meter runners would come in and do squats and sometimes bench presses. Watching a 10,000 meter runner, who's got a lot of slow twitch fibers just because of their genetics, do a bench press is the most terrible thing I've ever seen in my life in the sense that you they'll do a 10 rep max, more or less. The first rep is a grinder. 
and you're like, there's no way he's going to get another. Nobody has that kind of endurance. Sure enough, goes back down. Ooh, everything's a grinder. Like, oh my God, 10 grinders in a row. That probably means you're most slow twitch because to pull that off, you have to have high endurance muscle fibers, right? So if you're of that situation, adding to the idea that maybe that muscle group or maybe you as an individual tend to be more fast twitch or slow twitch depending on how you perform. Lastly, and maybe more importantly, how good are you relative to other individuals of your same size and body composition at endurance activities versus sprinting, jumping, and weightlifting moves? If you happen to weigh 180 pounds and you're pretty damn good at long distance running and you can do repetitions really well, especially if you're a CrossFitter and you really excel at the rep events, but at weightlifting movements, at jump height movements, at gymnastics movements, you're just not that good, you're probably more intermediate and slow twitch, less fast twitch. On the other hand, if you're amazing at the strength moves, super quick under the bar in weightlifting, can do gymnastics like the world is coming to an end, but every time there's an 800 meter run, you're like, oh my God, I'm just no good at this, even though I've been training for a long time, that probably indicates that you're more fast twitch, less slow twitch, and if you want a hypertrophy, you gotta bias it more into that uh, fast twitch versus slow twitch, right? So, that just about covered us up. Lots to think about. Anytime you pick your rep ranges, make sure you do use all the ones that you need, but keep that phasic approach in mind. You don't necessarily want to train everything all at once. Thanks for tuning in. See you next time.